my topic is on the study of platelet rich plasma injection in the management of tendinopathies. Uh, tendinopathy is a common painful condition with reduced functional capacity of the tendon associated with histopathological uh, findings of intratendinous failed healing response. The most frequent uh, discussed sites include the elbow, which includes the tennis elbow and golfer's elbow, rotator cuff, tendinopathies, Achilles tendon, and uh, plantar uh, uh, patellar tendon, and uh, plantar fasciitis. Multiple uh, treatment is described in the literature, including physical therapy, shock wave treatment, uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, and injections of uh, glu uh, glucocorticoids, uh, butylene uh, toxins, and platelet rich plasma. Currently, the use of uh, PRP, that is platelet rich uh, plasma, in tendinopathies is widespread, but its efficiency efficacy remains controversial. Hence, the study is being conducted to assess the efficacy and uh, tolerance of peritendinous injections of PRP. Uh, this study was performed between the 1st of August 2022 to 31st of October 2023 on patients with rotator cuff tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, plantar fasciitis, who came to our uh, hospital, which is Mahadeva Parampur Medical College. Uh, the objective, the study uh, to study the efficacy of the platelet-rich uh, plasma injections and in management of tendinopathies, to study the outcome of uh, autologous platelet-rich uh, plasma injection in tendinopathies. The inclusion criteria include clinically confirmed cases of tendinopathy, patients of age group 18 to 70, patients with 2 months duration of uh, symptoms like pain, uh, patient uh, numerical pain score more than 7. Exclusive criteria, infections or ulcers at the site of injections, recent local steroid injections, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, seronegative uh, spondyloarthritis. Uh, total of 30 patients were included in the study. Out of this 30, 10 presented with rotator cuff tendinopathy, 7 presented with Achilles tendinopathy, 13 with plantar fasciitis. After taking clinical history examination, adequate radiographs and blood investigations were done. Patients were ex explained regarding the procedure and the concern was given. Uh, coming to the procedure, uh, under aseptic precautions, around 20 to 25 ml of blood was drawn uh, from the capital vein. And the blood was equally divided uh, into citrate uh, white containers, uh, with each white container containing around 2 ml of blood. The citrate uh, white containers with uh, blood was taken for centrifuge. The vacutaneous were uh, placed in centrifuge and balancing was done. Uh, double centrifuge technique was used here. Uh, first centrifuge was done for 10 minutes with 2500 RPM. After 10 minutes of resting, uh, second centrifuge was again done. 10 minutes uh, with 2500 RPM. The platelet rich plasma was transferred into a 10 ml syringe. Under strict aseptic precautions, the parts were painted and draped. For rhetoric of endopathy, uh, it was done under ultrasound guidance. Uh, and for the other tendinopathy, the point of maximum tendinosis was noted and PH, PRP was injected around the tendon. The, the, in this study, 30 patients were included. Uh, patients were followed up 2 weeks, 6 weeks, 3 months in total. Numerical pain score was used before and during the follow-up. Coming to a rotator uh, cuff uh, tendinopathy case. Uh, it's a 35-year-old male with history of left shoulder pain since 3 to 5 4 months. On examination, uh, there was a full can test was positive. Uh, USC surgery of less supraspinatus tendinopathy. Patient was, was given uh, PRP under USD units. Achilles tendinopathy. A case of 27 year old male with history of left foot pain since 2 months. On examination, tendinopathy was present at the insertion of the Achilles tendon. The USG was done, it was surgery of left Achilles tendinopathy. Coming to plantar fasciitis. Uh, Case of 45 uh, year old male with history of left heel uh, pain since 3 months. On examination, tendinosis was present at the insertion of the plantar fasciitis of the calcaneum. On the calcaneum, USC surgery of left plantar fasciitis. Coming to uh, results, in rotator cuff tendinopathy, we had uh, to supraspinatus and bicep tendinosis, of uh, which uh, in supraspinatus, two patients were given uh, excellent uh, results. One was satisfactory and three were poor. In bicep tendinosis, two excellent and uh, two uh, poor results were given. In Achilles, out of uh, uh, three were excellent, two satisfactory and two poor patient, uh, outcomes. In plantar fasciitis, seven patient uh, was relieved of pain, two had satisfactory pain relief and uh, four uh, did not relieve of pain. Coming to the conclusion of the study, this uh, study provides an excellent and safe treatment modality in the treatment of tendinopathy. A maximum benefit after PRP injection was observed at two months to three months in the study. 20% uh, patients had relapse of pain after 6 months for which PRP was given again. 10% of the patient did not have relief from pain from PRP. 
uh, the, the more trials are required to optimize the technique for separating the platelet rich plasma. Thank you. Good evening, all. Um, uh, my uh, topic for today functional outcome of medial uh, patellar femur ligament reconstruction in recurrent patellar dislocation. Myself, Dr. Hoysal Gauda, and guide was Baska Pandari. I am from AJIMS uh, Bangalore. Um, recurrent patellar instability is a disabling condition commonly seen in young athletic population. Um, the medial patellar femur ligament, being the primary medial stabilizer of the patella, is injured in almost all patients following an acute patella dislocation. The optimal surgical treatment for chronic patella instability remains controversial, but reconstruction of MPFL has shown good results in restoring normal patella tracking. So the aim of my study was to evaluate the functional outcome of an isolated medial patella femoral ligament reconstruction in patients with recurrent patella dislocation and to assess the complication and relocation rates following surgery. So this was a hospital study uh, done in uh, AJ Institute of Medical Sciences, Mangalore. During uh, this period, about 26 patients with chronic patella instability were selected um, uh, based on the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The functional uh, assessment was done using Kulaja Patel of uh, Femoral Scoring System. The inclusion criteria the patient uh, with at least two episodes of patella dislocation and then patients who experienced episodes of recurrent patella subluxation or apprehension normal limb alignment, I mean there should not be any valgus or virus and uh, TT-TG ratio distance less than 20 mm Q angle uh, uh, lesser than 20, 20 degrees Exclusion criteria, uh, skeletal uh, immaturity were excluded, patella alta or in case of uh, trochlear dysplasia and TT-TG ratio being more than 20 mm and Q angle more than 20 degree uh, This is a patient demographic demographics. Uh, so we had total about 26 patients. Uh, 17 of them were about 20 years and 9 was uh, below 20 years. Um, mode of injury, uh, RTA and uh, skip and fall and sports injury being the common uh, causes of injury. Coming to surgical technique, so following all the administration of anesthesia and prophylactic antibiotics, the patient is positioned supine with a above knee tourniquet. Skin preparation with sterile raping are carried out in a standard manner. The diagnostic knee arthroscopy is performed to evaluate uh, patella and trochlear chondral surfaces and to look for any intra-articular lesions. Graph, graph selection in our study, uh, gracilis autograph is preferred uh, and also most surgeons prefer uh, gracilis because it uh, has appropriate tensile strength and easily harvested and is small enough uh, to fit through small bone tunnels. Uh, coming to intra photos, um, uh, harvesting of the gracilis autograph, uh, then preparation of the medial uh, patella surface, drilling the trans patella tunnels to pass the uh, sutures, and looping of the sutures across the tunnel, as you can see in this live photos. Next, we uh, pass the fiber loop, fiber wire loop through the patella tunnels. Then uh, that is by using a bead pin uh, we do and then uh, graft fixation on the patella, passing of the graft between the two layers uh, so that we can uh, uh, relate it to the uh, femoral uh, condyle and they drop uh, localization of steroids points. Uh, passing the graft through the femoral tunnel and graft fixation using a bioabsorbable uh, interference screw. Uh, Post-op rehabilitation, postoperatively. The knee is immobilized in a hinged knee brace which was uh, locked in full extension for the first few weeks along with uh, pain and swelling control, ankle pumps, leg raising exercises as well as stat static quadriceps muscle strengthening exercises were initiated immediately post-op. Weight bearing is allowed to be tolerated uh, immediately after the surgery with knee brace and crutch support. First, the first two uh, post-operative weeks, knee flexion is restricted to 60 degree after which uh, use of a knee brace is discouraged and knee flexion is increased up to 90 degree over the third post-operative week. Walking with full weight bearing is usually possible three weeks after surgery. From three to six weeks post-op, uh, knee flexion is gradually increased to reach the full ROM and crutches are discontinued. Controlled sports are avoided at least for five months, uh, sorry, three months post-op. 
complication, uh, common complication or complications seen in the study are recurrent uh, instability, patella fractures, patellofemoral arthrosis, uh, residual pain, and loss of uh, flexion, and as obvious, own complications. Uh, this is a diagram of all the results. Uh, representation of pre and post of uh, VAS score. This graph uh, showing the pre and post of knee flexion, which is considerably increased. Pre and post of scoring based on the Kulaja scoring system. The final uh, final outcome. So uh, about 11% uh, had excellent outcome and 80% uh, of them all belonged in the uh, good category. The mean age of the uh, discussion of the study, the mean age of the uh, patient um, was about uh, 24 years. Um, in our study, 92% uh, of them achieved full range of motion and the affected knee by 6 months follow after surgery, whereas two patients had lack of flexion of 10 to 20 degree compared to the uh, normal knee. The study has certain strengths and limitations. First benefit is the transosseous suture technique allowed placements of tunnels with smaller diameter than traditional patella uh, uh, tunnel techniques, which preserve more bone and technically reduce the risk of patella fractures. The other okay, advantage. Dr. Gorda, your time is up. Yes. Uh, conclusion in our study, we concluded that an isolated middle uh, patella fra fracture. Uh, by using transosseous suture technique, uh, we uh, found with a very good outcome. Okay, thank you. Okay, so you can stay back. And uh, also Dr. Gogul, the first speaker. So first question to Dr. Gaudai. First is, main, uh, is mainly an observation. The youngsters who are presenting this, please stick to your timelines, right? And you don't need three slides of introduction. You don't need four slides of discussion. You can just introduce the topic and tell what is your research question. What is it that you hypothesize and then go on to the materials and methods. Present your results well. You had some very good images in your slide, right, of the technique. So when you are saying surgical technique, your pictures could have gone with the description of the text. And if you are describing a novel technique, something new, it makes sense to go into the details. If it is a standard reconstructive technique, you can just write we did it according to the standard protocols, standard rehab protocols. In a paper, you don't really need to do all this. So my question to you, Dr. Gowda, is what was the novelty in the study and how do you think this adds to the existing literature? Patella dislocation uh, can be managed by various methods and most of the but studies... Other people really, have, other authors have also described the same thing, right? right? Yeah, but uh, most of the literature or the papers available, uh, they don't give a fixed uh, definition or uh, the, like big you can do by transosseous social method, uh, by uh, different methods. Right? So in, we using this transosseous suturing technique uh, wanted to sh uh, show the... Uh, Where is your control group then? You want to say A is better than B? Observational uh, study, sir. I mean, sir. Not comparing with other studies. So the, the idea is again not to put anybody down, but it is for you. So you present it very well. You have obviously done your study also very well. It is also to give you an idea for the future. So an observational small sample size study is probably 90% of Indian studies. Either come up with something very novel or have a control group so that you can say A is better than B or B is better than A. Okay, yes, yes. Okay, so a uh, quick question for Dr. Gokul. Do you think apples and oranges are the same? Do you think apples and oranges are same? Then how can you compare plantar fasciitis to rotator cuff tear? I mean, one is in the foot, the other is in the shoulder. Yes, sir, but. Uh, do agree that they are the same apples and oranges? It's not the same sir, but we got around, uh, my study was basically 30, but we did around 50 uh, patients with uh, rotator cuff and uh, another 50. But in, so again, I am not trying to put anything down and please try to understand. So when you go to, you know, so the idea to grill you here is also to prepare you for even more presentation, right? Again, you present it very well, it's good work. But then when you are thinking of indications, try to think of one indication secondary outcome measures. If you club that rotator cuff thing with the plantar fasciitis, it would not make any sort of sense. I, uh, and the tendo Achilles also, which by the way, all of them have different biomechanics. I agree to that sir, but uh, considering the patient load and all that, it's still Okay, we agree. Presentation. Good evening sir. 
today's uh, paper presentation is about a case of Hercules uh, deformity. Excessive. Hey, unless this is the Barbie movie, please don't have this. Or in pink fonts, it's very difficult. And you know, it's considerable proportion of the percentage of the audience is color blind. They don't know it. So please have clear fonts. It's okay. very important. Right? Okay. Uh, with the uh, FHL tendon augmentation, a case report. The Achilles tendon is considered the largest and strongest tendon in the human body. Uh, nothing, uh, nonetheless, the okay, we, we know we know this part. So I told you to take a cue from the first two speakers. Get to the point. Uh, case presentation: The 50-year-old female uh, reported uh, the inability to move her left ankle, probably about year, one year, which was uh, accompanied by heel pain. For the past la for the last six months, the patient experienced worsening pain with every movement in her left ankle, causing difficulty walking and delivery during rest. The patient is a known case of diabetes mellitus. Uh, inspection of the left ankle revealed the presence of Haglund deformity and the positive Matlis test. The Thompson's test was positive on the left ankle. A pain, uh, plain X-ray of uh, lateral projection of the patient left ankle revealed the presence of osteophytes and the uh, cancellous bone and the confirmed Haglund deformity. These are the X-ray pics. Uh, surgical technique: a yeah, six centimeter skin incision was made over. Okay, the stop. What was your diagnosis at this moment, sir? Uh, it shows a uh, osteophyte over the posterior uh, posterior aspect of the calcaneum. But you said that patient had no plantar flexion. Is it a normal phenomena with hand? Uh, right. Thompson was positive. Okay. What does that mean? Sir, uh, patient uh, can't. Uh, Okay, please finish the, your case. Okay. Yeah, 6 cm incision was made over the posterior aspect of the heel. Uh, then explored the deep fascia until the Achilles tendon was viewable and the pointed edge of the haglet deformity was revealed. Haglet deformity was resected and the osteophytes was removed and the posterior superior calcaneal osteotomy was done. Then proximally uh, over the ankle joint, FHL tendon was identified and 2 cm incision was made in the plantar aspect of the great toe. The FHL tendon was stripped off and the tunnel was made in the anterior posterior way in the calcaneum and the FHL was sutured with the tender place. These are the intropics. Uh, following the completion of the tendon reconstruction, the wound was closed with a compressive dressing and a splint was used to maintain the ankle position in 150 plantar flexion and there is no sign of infection. Uh, results uh, There were no post-operative complications or sign of infection in the surgical uh, wound with the mild pain reported by the patient. The patient was advised to walk on crunches for 4 weeks while uh, wearing slabs. Not weight bearing exercises were performed for one month and were then shifted to weight bearing exercises the following month. After one week follow, the patient has still had limited uh, active and passive range of motion. One month after the surgery, the patient reported minimal pain uh, with a limited ROM of her left ankle. Uh, she is still receiving the physiotherapy on the regular basis to train the movement of her left ankle. Discussion. Reconstruction surgery utilizing the tendon transfer can help uh, restore the Achilles tendon strength, improving the patient's uh, quality of life. The FHL tendon is frequently used with is uh, closest to the Achilles tendon. The technique is helpful for Achilles tendon reconstruction because it is one of the longest tendon and provides adequate strength to assist the uh, Achilles tendon function. The FHL technique is regarded as the most theoretically advantageous method of tendon repair. Uh, the pic shows uh, three months uh, follow of the patient. Conclusion: The deformity was responsible for the degenerative process and the injury to the surrounding tissues. FHL tendon transfer and surgical resection of the hanglin deformity and the osteophytes were used to resolve the rupture. Chronic Achilles tendon rupture is more difficult to manage than acute Achilles tendon rupture because it is associated with the uh, scar tissue formation at the tendon gap, causing uh, ankle dysfunction. The FHL tendon transfer improved the patient's clinical condition as, a, as evidence of functional improvement, uh, anatomical improvement, uh, and pain management. Thanks.
but should be more than two lines. Ideally, all points. So have five points on the slide and have it in one line, right? And then in your last slide, there was a lot of empty space there. So try to use that whole space. You said that the FHL transfer is a type of repair. It is not repair. It is augmentation. So when you have Hagland, often times there is a you know degeneration of the tendon. We debride it, sometimes we debride it partially, sometimes we debride completely and then put it back with the suture anchor. That part is the tendon repair part. The FHL is to augment the plantar flexion that helps in giving good results. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Charan Devasiri, sir. I am from Ashram Medical College, Taylor, sir. And my paper is on a comparative study of functional results of cemented versus uncemented hemiarthroplasty using bipolar prosthesis in the treatment of intracapsular femoral neck fractures in elderly people. Introduction, sir. Fem femoral neck fractures is a common injury that leads to increased morbidity and mortality postoperatively in old age patients. Two arthroplasty procedures are available for the treatment of intracapsular fractures. Sir. One is uh, hemiarthroplasty and the next is uh, total head replacement. The present study was to take up was taken to know functional outcome and clinical outcomes of intracapsular uh, fracture of femur neck with bipolar processes with cemented and uncemented hemiarthroplasty. Aim sir, the purpose of this two-centered randomization equivalence trial was to compare hemiarthroplasty using cemented implant and uh, hydroxyapatite coated proximal press fit uncemented implant with the following three research aims. Sir. First one was to check the differences in intraoperative events, okay, is, are they detectable or no? And the second one is, are there any differences in the functional outcome and quality of life at 3 months and 1 year or are the results equivalent in both cemented implant and uncemented implants? And the third one is, are the rates of postoperative morbidity and mortality similar between both the groups? Objective, sir. It is to evaluate the intraoperative and postoperative events in cemented and uncemented hemiarthroplasty. And to study the end results of bipolar processes with respect to stability, sir, and to elucidate whether hemiarthroplasty using either uncemented or cemented implant for the treatment of femur neck fractures yields the same clinical outcome. Patients and methods, sir. The place of study is. Department of Orthopedic Sailors, sir, and the year of study is from December 2022 to January 2024, sir. A sample size of 30 cases is taken, sir, and the study type is prospective randomization compared to studies. Methodology, sir. All the patients are preoperatively evaluated by detailed history, complete clinical examination is performed, sir. Medical conditions if present were treated, sir. Patients were operated based on the randomization code they received, sir. Inclusion criteria, sir. Patients having femur neck fracture, intracapsular, sir, and adult patients aged more than 60 years, both male and female. Sir. Patients medically fit for surgery, patients who, who were ambulated before the fracture, and patients who were willing to give their informed consent. Exclusion criteria includes the pathological fracture of neck of femur, sir, and patients not willing, patients which who were presented with polytrauma, sir, and patients with a past history of symptomatic disease of hip, such as osteoarthritis, sir and patients who were unable to walk before the fractures. So this is one case, sir. A patient named Sesh Gedrao, 86 year old male. He had a history of fall from stage, sir, and complaints of pain and swelling on the left hip, sir. This presentation of short, shortening of the limb and external rotation is present, sir. All the nerves were intact, sir, and he was able to walk, sir, with pain. And this is the post-operative image, sir. Uncemented uh, hypoarthroplasty uh, is done in, in this patient, sir. Cemented bipolar hemiarthroplasty indications, sir. They, these are the general indications, sir. The, generally, these are done in osteoporotic patients and uh, when there is uh, malignancy or bone irradiation presence and there is presence of abnormal white femoral canals. This is the second case, sir. The patient name is Meera Baisa. She is a 73 year old female. She had history of fall in the washroom and uh, complaints of pain and swelling on the, around the left limb, sir. There is Shortening of the limb and the external rotation is present, sir. Her nerve and uh, sensations are all intact, sir. So, this is a cemented hemi bipolar hemiarthroplasty, sir. Sir, the modern technique of cementing involves preparation of the femoral canal using serial broaching and a pulsatile lavage to wash the canal and remove the depressor. sir. A cement restrictor is placed at, the, at an appropriate distance to prevent the cement from traveling down the canal, sir. 
So there we can see the same. The cement restrictor there is uh, below in the distal part. The cement is filled in the canal using a cement gun that pressurizes the cement injection in the canal. Sir. The gun ensures that cement is not eviscerated by the bleeding in the canal. Sir. The femoral stem is inserted to pressurize the cement and the upper system, the cement pressure is maintained during the insertion. Sir. A proximal seal is made to ensure adequate pressure during polymerization of the cement. Sir. Discussion, sir. 15 cases of cemented and 15 cases of uncemented were taken, sir. 50-50% uh, ratio is taken sir, completely. So, uh, complications were e distributed equally between the groups. Three patients in cemented group and one in the uncemented group uh, needed re-surgery sir. There were no intraoperative deaths, but there was one post-op death within 72 hours sir. One patient in the cemented group experienced a severe decrease in blood pressure during the cementing procedure and died within 24 hours going to acute myocardial infarction sir. This trial does not have statistical power to address the adverse effects of cement as we did not find any indications or differences between the groups related to cementing. So, the incidence of serious cement related complications has been reported to be low. So, this shows, the graph shows mean difference in uh, hash 6 score between the two groups at 3 and 12 months. So, both the central CH show uh, lies wholly inside the Zone of equivalence and zero, sir, indicating the results are in the uncemented group are near equivalence. We have checked the scores of Harris score and uh, Barthel index in comparison, sir. Conclusion, sir. Hemiathroplasty is a treatment in displaced fracture next, sir. So, what I conclude is. Uh, Your time is up. Intraoperative blood loss is actually greater in. Where uh, either intracapsular fractures or subtrochanthic fractures, because you have shown one as intracapsular and the other as subtrochanthic, you cannot compare both as this thing. For uncemented, you have shown subtrochanthic fracture. For uncemented, you have shown an intracapsular fracture. You have to take a specific intracapsular fractures comparison, but and you have not mentioned anything about why you have chosen a cemented implant in a type 1 type of, uh, a type of marrow canal. Should be. Yes. It was actually wider, sir. So I have not seen that. And both are like angled the thick cortex with the. Why? It was wider than you have chosen cemented. Yes. Yes. But you said it was randomized. Then how can you choose? No, sir. After entering into. After going into the OT, then uh, sir actually... What is the purpose of randomization? Like we do it without... What is pseudo-randomization? No, I, because you say it is a randomized control trial. So it means that patient goes into a cemented or uncemented group. And now you cannot change it. If you change it, like I agree with uh, what sir is saying, what you have shown is a subtrochantric, pertrochantric fracture which can be easily managed by PFM or any other sort of uh, uh, you know, osteosynthesis implant, why should you replace it? It does not even match your diet definition of an inclusion criteria. Yeah. Good, that would good bone star. Yes. That would be the good bone star. If it is uh, different, this thing, type C canal and bone star is not there, then it's different. But it is good bone star. And then when you are showing your results, there should be a slide of results. Don't present your results in discussion. Finally, when you say it is underpowered to detect cement complications, I say it is underpowered to detect anything. With 30 cases, how can you even detect an intraoperative fracture difference? So I hope everybody knows the concept of statistical power. If a complication rate is 1 in 100, you need to see 100 cases before you say that complication has not happened. If you have done only 30 cases and you have not seen 100, then how will you pick up a 1 in 100? All of the things that you are saying should be first determined by a sample size estimation. Okay, so there is a way to calculate a sample size on the basis of your primary outcome. If your primary outcome is an intraoperative adverse event, then it should be. And that would boil down to at least a minimum of 200 to 300 cases in each group. Okay, so again all of these comments are for your improvement. We are not trying to put you down. Thank you. So can we have... Good evening, sir. Myself, Dr. Narendra, postgraduate from Ashram Hospital, Elul, 
Today's my paper presentation is on positioning of a solar component in primary total hip arthroplasty using CT guided parameters of normal hip and anatomical landmarks. The primary aim of total hip arthroplasty is to create a stable, functional and painless hip. The early complication of total hip arthroplasty is dislocation. Amongst various factors influencing dislocation, component malposition is an important factor which is under control of surgeon. Agbold and others use the transverse acetabular ligament as a landmark for acetabular cup positioning. Therefore, a simple, practical and anatomically based alignment method to position the acetabular cup is used. Study period is from November 2022 to January 2024. Patients with fused hips were excluded because the acetabular margin could not be defined on CT images. The mean age of 8 men and 4 women was 53.6 years. The indication for protein pathoplasty was femoral head osteonecrosis in 5 hips and fracture neck of femur in 7 patients. Mechanical guides and computer navigation system have been designed to provide proper positioning. Computer assisted navigation system is not available in all centers, adds cost to the procedure and additional surgical time. Inclusion criteria Age 19 to 78 years, osteoarthritis, inflammatory arthritis, acute femoral neck fractures due to high failure rate in internal fixation, non union neck of femur fracture, malunited intertrochanic fracture of femur. Exclusion Fused hips, severely dysplastic hips, revision total hip replacement. Pre op evaluation CT pelvis with 3D reconstruction done to measure two parameters. A stubborn antiversion and inclination. For bilateral hip cases, the least involved side was taken, and for unilateral hip cases, the contralateral normal side was taken to measure the parameters. Surgical technique the position is lateral and approach is lateral or posterior approach. After removal of the femoral head on the stubborn rim, two notches are identified. Transverse stubborn notch on the inferior margin of the cotton. Okay, the stop. You don't want to describe the cup placement. Show us how you measured the cup antiversion. You say that you are showing some simple technique, right? So show us how that measurement was. That is more important. Sir, inclination, uh, we will have the horizontal line at the tip of the ischial tuberosity and the line drawn from the posterior to anterior rest of the line. So this is the measurement, right? But then, what are you doing with this intraoperatively? So the same angles can also be measured on x-rays. At least the inclination can be easily measured. Okay, so then what is the different thing that you are doing here? Sir, in the operation, based on the hastabular inclination is more than 40 degrees, the inferior part of the component is placed outside the transverse hastabular notch. And if measure a sub less than 40 degrees, the inferior part of the component is placed within the transverse sub We want to see these points. Are they going to come up in your presentation? Okay. Yes. Please continue. Points are taken opposite to the transverse transverse acetabular notch on the inferior margin of the cotton for the inferior point, acetabular notch on the anterior margin, this is the anterior point. Two other different points are taken opposite to the transverse acetabular notch is the superior point, and opposite to the anterior acetabular notch is the posterior point. Cup inclination is made in reference to superior and <coughs> inferior points, and antiversion is made in reference to the anterior and posterior points. For cup inclination, if measured acetabular inclination is more than 40 degrees, inferior part of the component is placed outside the transverse acetabular notch, and if measured the acetabular inclination is less than 40 degrees, inferior part of the component is placed within the transverse acetabular notch. And for cup version, if measured acetabular antiversion is more than 15 degrees, the anterior part of the component is placed inside the anterior acetabular notch, and if it is less than 15 degrees, anterior part of the component is placed outside the anterior acetabular notch. Post-op protocol. 
cost of radiographs taken on day 1 and CT taken on day 2, as stronger inclination and version measure checked if within the safe range. All call patients had post op rate 3 months, 6 months, and 9th month and 12th month radiographs taken. All patients are followed up for one year. So these are the CT images taken pre op and post op. And based on the version before the surgery, the medialization is done and the version is improved. Astrogar inclination in this case is 41 degrees previous surgery and 39 degrees in the post -op. And this is the case to serve. Astrogar anti-version is 17 degrees pre-op and it's the same in the post -op. And inclination is 37 degrees in the pre op and 39 degrees in the post -op. And this is case 3. A server company anti-version is 14 degrees in the pre op and it is 13 degrees in the post op And a stabular inclination is 40 degrees in the pre op and 40 degrees in the post op This is case 4, sir. And a stabular anti-version of the Lid. So this is the functional outcome of total hypothyroidy by this method was measured by Harris hip score. The mean pre-operative Harris hip score was 36.5 and the mean post-operative Harris hip score was 85.7. Mean acerbic cup inclination was 41.6 and mean cup inclination was 14.4. No dislocation was noted up to one year of follow. I call Dr. Manjesh Kumar from Karnataka and presenting paper on the paper on the functional outcome of distal tibia fractures treated using the minimally invasive percutaneous plate obstruction disease technique with a locking compression plate. Reaction. The management of distal tibia metaphyseal fractures of tibia is an arduous but uh, because of the limited blood supply, subcutaneous location and inadequate soft tissue cover. Uh, most tibia fractures are managed surgically using ORF with plating or closed reduction and percutaneous plating or external fixation. Conservative management can be applied to stable and displaced closed fractures. Complications reported following treatment of distal tibia fractures are malunion, shortening of the affected leg, early osteoarthritis of the ankle, limited range of moment. Here we use the AO or the OTA classification or the Rudy Arduo classification for the distal tibia where it is divided to type 1, 2 and 3. Uh, the minimally invasive percutaneous plate osteosynthesis with locking compression. Let's plates. go to your materials and methods or your whatever aims of the study. For minimally invasive percutaneous plate osteosynthesis, we know this. Let's go to the this study. We prospectively treated 30 patients presenting to the casualty of the ER between November 2022 to June 23. The Department of Orthopedics, VMKB College. Uh, the inclusion criteria is all patients with age more than 18 years, diagnosis of intra-articular, partially articular and extra-articular combination, fracture, mainly AO, OTA 1 and 2 classification, or the radiological diagnosis of fractures with the classification based on radial lower, exclusion criteria, patients with polytrauma and open fractures and uh, who are uh, unfit for surgery. Uh, other patients were surgically managed by the MIPO technique with LCP under spinal or general anesthesia, tonic was used, we made an, uh, these are the uh, incision and uh, pre-op and post-op x-ray. Uh, the surgical details of MIPO taking for the patients. Uh, the time interval from uh, injury to surgery is uh, is measured here. The duration of surgery, the length of hospital stay and healing time was measured. The post-operative uh, protocol, the limb elevation for the first 2-5 to five days, immediate physiotherapy with active assisted exercises, radiological and clinical follow-up after 1-3 one, one, three, one, three and 6 months. Based on consolidation of the fracture, partial weight bearing was started uh, half a month and full, full weight bearing was usually allowed after three months. All the patients were followed up carefully for the complications until the fractures healed and the year after every month for up to six months. Assessment of the functional radial outcomes were performed under the American Orthopedic Foot and Angle Society score. Uh, this scale comprises uh, the various uh, grading systems here. The American Foot and Angle Society says that please don't use this score. They have come out with two papers that we should not use this score. Which I, this is why I am surprised that you are using this call. Okay, please continue. So the pre and post-op exercise of the patients which we have treated, 1, 2 and 3. The 6 months follow-up of the patients with the uh, uh, proper uh, dorsiflexion of the ankle without any complications. 
results in the present prospective study there was no loss to follow up and assess 30 patients at regular intervals 1 3 and 6 months as per evo classification sizable number of patients were presented with type a tumor fracture while uh, 9 presented with type b fracture the mean healing time was uh, 17 plus or, plus or minus 3 weeks so the response rate was 100% according to the ifr scale out of 30 patients uh, four patients had an excellent outcome 20 had good outcome and uh, six had an acceptable outcome but none had a bad outcome in this study, the most common complication of MIPO technique of the distal tibia fractures was delayed union uh, in four patients, followed by malunion in two patients, and infection and implant failure in one patient each. In this question, the MIPO technique is based on the principle of biological osteosynthesis with the use of fracture hematoma and minimal destruction of the soft tissue at the fracture site. The MIPO technique is useful for the management of distal tibia, AO, OTA, type A, and B type, uh, B type fractures with a reduced hospital stay, cost effectiveness, and infection rate. Among 30 study subjects, no one scores a bad, uh, bad uh, category according to IFOS and nearly 6 of them had developed complications with MIPO technique. The high success rate and the high prevalence of complication may be because of influence of low sample size which need further evaluation. Uh, the MIPO, uh, conclusion, the MIPO with the help of CRM guidance can be a helpful technique for the management of distal tibia fractures because it tenders to a speedy recovery with reduced possibility of malunion and deformities. Meanwhile, it offers the very smallest incision and decreases the upcoming complications as it aids in timely mobilization of the ankle moment and decreases the odds of infection, improving the clinical and functional outcome. Thank you. Okay, so what do you mean by high success rate and high complication? It can be one thing or the other. You cannot say that you have so, scaling. AFAS is an outdated score. I told you, American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society does not recommend it. What else you have to say? So your uh, good is based on the AOFS score? Like we have done the study based on AOFS. You should not have done the AOFS score. There are other scores like uh, Manchester Oxford foot score or some other foot and ankle specific scores. But if your complication rate in 30 people is 6, right, this is a 20% complication rate. It means 1 in every 5 patients will have a complication. Then how can you com conclude that this is a good result? What do you think is a more objective way of looking at a study? Some functional outcome score or a hard complication that you can pick up? Yes, if my head is aching today and you do my AFA score, I will be pissed off. I will answer everything like that. You say pain, I said yes, pain. Right? So you see why fun functional outcome scoring is very important. But it is very subjective. But if you have to choose between one, so when you are choosing a primary outcome, please always choose a hard outcome. Right? So, non-union and delayed union is a hard outcome. Implant failure, wound dehiscence is a hard outcome. Right? So, choose this thing very, very carefully. It doesn't matter whether you had complications or not. But the conclusion should be made accordingly. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Dr. Gaudias, my paper uh, topic is Latter Jet Procedure as Surgical Management Among the Patients with Recurrent Shoulder uh, Dislocation. So it was done by uh, our staff, uh, Dr. Shishti and the co-author is Dr. Mithun Shetty from AJMS Bangalore. So coming to the introduction, as you all know, shoulder joint is a ball and socket type of joint with a maximum range of mobility and uh, which is a very unstable joint compared to other hip and uh, elbow joint. So for the any dislocation, we need to treat it with either uh, simply by using sling or immobilization or through surgical techniques. So in surgical techniques, uh, complex uh, soft tissue tear, we go through bank cards repair, which is uh, very uh, tough for, uh, it's very challenging with the arthroscopic line and uh, you need a lot of uh, requirements for the surgery. But for one uh, surgery, that is data jet, where you can do open way or, or arthroscopic way, but uh, open way is better and uh, less uh, surgical skill or uh, equipment is required. So aim of this study, in, in this study, we evaluate effectiveness and complications of data jet procedure for the treatment of recurrent anterior instability of the shoulder in the, in the parameter of range of motion, pain relief and relief of, uh, from apprehension. So I use my hospital inpatient OPD patients with uh, recurrent uh, dislocation about more than uh, four, or 4 to 10 uh, episodes of anterior dislocation. So it was 24 months uh, study and uh, it is a prospective observation study. I included patients with recurrent dislocation with uh, bony bank cards, failed uh, bank card repair recurrent anterior shoulder dislocation with off-track collision, multiple times anterior dislocation which is more than 5 and uh, with more than 15% lenoid bone loss and recurrent uh, shoulder dislocation with heel satch lesion. 
and a recurrent shoulder dislocation with anterior instability with previous surgical repair and patient with uh, humeral avulsion with glenomerular ligament. So I excluded a patient uh, who had uh, age group less than 17 and uh, with slab tear and <coughs> the massive instability of uh, rotator cuff patients more than 50 years and post-traumatic uh, inferior subluxation and patients who had uncontrolled epilepsy. So in this result I used a row score for the instability so which, uh, which, which usually contains a serial of question, questionnaire whether the patient is able to do his daily, daily activity or not. So based on that the low table shows that the pre-op uh, row score is 35 plus or minus 10 and uh, uh, increased to 85 to plus or minus uh, 9 degrees of uh, this thing row score and uh, p value less than 0 0.05 which is significant improvement in the row score. In the mean and standard deviation of the coming to the flexion uh, on follow up from four, 1 to 3 weeks and uh, 16 to 20 weeks up to 16 to 20 weeks. In this table we, should, uh, we see comparison shows average changes in the RO from first follow up to, uh, to the last follow up that is 30 weeks. There is a uh, increase in the ROM of the uh, shoulder that is up to 104 degrees uh, and uh, with p-value less than 0.5 percent and the mean difference normal range on the last follow-up was a 0.5 uh, I mean 5.26 percentage so on mean follow-up of abduction as well uh, it shows uh, from first to last follow-up of 136 degree uh, with p-value of less than 0.05 and uh, the mean difference is uh, of in percentage was uh, uh, 5.70. So in this discussion, uh, majority of the patients were male and rest were them uh, with the female. And five patients, uh, in five patients, four had uh, right-sided instability and one had left-sided instability. Among five patients, four had no limitation with uh, return to daily activity and one patient had mild uh, limitation. Most of the patients had a loss of external rotation about uh, 15 degrees. That was the only uh, drawback was there. Among five uh, patients, four had uh, five to ten episodes of dislocation and one had uh, uh, 11 to uh, 22, uh, 20 dislocation. None of the patients had recurrent shoulder dislocation following surgery. So in conclusion, uh, in comparison to the other studies, our study shows uh, the mean age of incidence of anterior uh, instability in 28 years as a mean age group and relief of apprehension, pain and increase in ROM and significant improvement in the uh, daily activity when returned to the sport. Thus, the letter based procedure is the dependable alternative for the surgical management of recurrent shoulder instability in situation of bone loss, more than 15% uh, glenoid surface area. May also be considered for the primary treatment of recurrent shoulder instability in higher uh, contact athletes, basically athletes and other uh, hard workers, daily, daily uh, hard working people, and even in the uh, setting of limitations of osteoarthritis deficiency and uh, adherence in the strict post operative physiotherapy. But the, the key of the achieving for the full range of motion. So, here are the uh, pre-op uh, apprehension test which was positive in the patient and this was the picture portion we used and the uh, incision was from uh, the uh, uh, coracoid process extending up to the uh, delta popular groove and uh, uh, harvesting of the coracoid process over the anterior surface of the glenoid and preparation of the glenoid and uh, fixation of the graft. Any questions for him? How this lateral procedure differs from previous? Previous reviews to do them, putting flat and other things. But so come with this Bristol's procedure is the shoulder being dislocated. So purely it is basically used for recurrent shoulder dislocation, which is the end stage treatment. So. In, in case of bad cuts, lesion and all, there will only soft tissue involved, but glenoid involvement will be much less. So this we can consider with uh, which requires very less uh, 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 intraoperative desires like scopy or anything and very challenging, you need to learn scopy and do. Instead of that, this procedure is way better compared to the other complex scoping procedures. Okay. Yeah, Chairperson and delegates, I am Dr. Kathik Rajki Vinay from Pokhara Epidemi of Health Sciences, Pokhara, Nepal. And my talk is on the topic and observation study on post-operative hemoglobin label in patients undergoing total hip replacement with fractured neck of femur, red versus the top brain. The incidence of femur neck fractures has increased over the past 30 years. Every year, approximately 250,000 in the United States seek treatment for the same 
but reported annual cost exceeding more than $4.4 billion. The study conducted in one of the institutes of Nepal showed incidence of hip fractures to be around 29.4%. Total hip replacement is the most common treatment option for this place to make a few fractures, especially in high demanding patients who are cognitively intact, independently mobile and active. Rates have been used with varying success in orthopedic surgery for many years. However, there is still a debate over the use of rates following hip fracture surgery. The rationale of our study was to ascertain the role of brain. This study was done to find out the pattern of hemoglobin fall on each post-operative day in both the groups and there is a deal of study about this topic especially in our past and over. General objectives of our study was to observe the pattern of falling hemoglobin in post-operative patients of fractured leg of femur in both the groups and specific objective was to compare the prevalence of anemia in different post-operative days and to evaluate the hospital stay of patients in both the groups and assess the patient's mobilized status and range of motion of him in both the groups. Our study was a prospective observational study conducted in three pioneer institutes of the country, National Trauma Center, Civil Service Hospital and Parkour Hospital, with a duration of study of 16 months, and we commenced our study after approval from Institutional Review Committee of National Academy of Medical Sciences. All the patients more than 60 years with fractured neck of humor undergoing total hip replacement were our inclusion criteria. And its exclusion criteria was patients with other associated injuries, patients with hematological disorders and malignancies that involves the proximal femur, patients requiring for operative transfusions and neurological psychiatric disorders and comorbid conditions that includes surgery. So we included 35 cases in both arms and sampling method was conveyed in sampling and every alternative, alternative cases we kept in and one gram of calcium acid was given prior to the procedure. So this is our uh, protocol of the study. We followed uh, posterior approach to hip in all the cases. So regarding the results, uh, most of the patients were male uh, of 64.28 percent as compared to female, and most of the patients fall in the age category of 60 to 65 years. Average hemoglobin preoperatively was 10.6 gram percent in patients with drain and 10.2 gram percent in patients without drain. So regarding the post-operative fall of hemoglobin, it was marked on the third day and then slowly began to rise, which was much more marked in patients without drain. Most of the patients with drain were discharged on 8 to 9 post-operative day and for patients without with drain were discharged on 10 to 14 post-operative day. Both the patients were mobilized on the second post-operative day and were ambulated as per protocol. Regarding the range of motion of the hip joint, it was assessed on 5th day and 14th post-operative day, and which was better assessed and observed in patient without rain. So regarding the discussion, our study was similar to study conducted by Fitzpan et al, where the post-operative hemoglobin fall on the third post-operative day and then began to rise. So regarding the length of hospital stay, it was similar to study done by Fitzpan et al and Obedi et al, where the patients without rain were discharged earlier. So the conclusion of our study was neck of femur fracture was covered in age group of 60 to 65 years with mean age group of 62 plus minus 0.32 years with male predominant. Post-operative hemoglobin decreased on first three post-operative day and then began to rise which was more mild in patient without pain. Then the postural stay was less in lower pain group. Range of motion of hip was better in patient with no pain. So our study showed that THR patients with draw drain have longer hospital stay. Limitations of our study was it was limited to only three hospitals. Duration of study was of 16 months. Follow-up in post-operative hemoglobin was limited to only five days. Sample size was 35 in both arms. It was surgery dependent and factors like incidence of dependent thrombosis, visual angle score were taken into consideration. Thank you so much.